Thank you all so much for having me. It's wonderful to be at Bang Bang Con. I am a programmer and a project manager, as you just heard. So I notice edge cases, right? That is just part of the, the occupational hazard, right? Of being one of us is someone says there are rules. Here are the rules. You notice instantly there is a possibility that one conditional will intersect with another, will intersect with a, but what if 0.01% of these people already have Mastodon accounts? <laughs> <laughs> And if someone tries to say, here's the common case, here's the common flow of how people will come into this system and what they're going to try to do, you know, it's hard because I can only perceive sometimes what goes off to the sides, right? And, and their words end up dying in this conversation like a log going through a buzzsaw. <laughs> and this doesn't just show up with computer stuff, right? It's, it's everywhere I perceive. Let's talk about the New York State Consolidated Vehicle and Traffic Law. Just as an example, Title Seven Rules of the Road, Article 34B, Riding Horses, Section 1261, traffic laws apply to persons riding or leading horses. <laughs> Fair enough, but there's no definition of horse. <laughs> 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 and there's a place for it. It would be in Title One, words and phrases defined between Section 118, Highway, and 119, House Coach. <laughs> what? So does this apply to camels? <laughs> what about mules? I mean, what about the Trojan horse, huh? What if I run that <laughs> and wheeled it in? Now, there is Article 23, Obedience to and Effect of Traffic Laws, Section 1105, Traffic Laws Apply to Persons Riding Animals or Driving Animal-Drawn Vehicles. But they never define horse as an instance of class animal. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're just supposed to assume that. <laughs> now, okay, I'm going to guess this is approximately never actually a problem for the law enforcement apparatus of the state of New York. And it's probably not worth paying the lawyers to find some biological classification of horse to put into the statute. But they do have a definition of ice cream. <laughs> because in Title Three, Article 9, Section 375, there's motor vehicles engaged in retail sales of frozen desserts directly to consumers, uh, ice cream trucks. And mm. as used in this subdivision, frozen dessert shall mean ice cream, frozen <laughs> custard, French ice cream, French custard ice cream, artificially sweetened ice cream, ice milk, artificially sweetened ice milk. <laughs> fruit sherbet, non-fruit sherbet, it goes on and on. It covers frozen yogurt. It covers things I've never heard of. And then, and any products which are similar in appearance, odor, or taste to such products or are prepared or frozen as frozen desserts are customarily prepared or frozen, whether made with dairy products or non-dairy products. So they're covering their bases <laughs> with ice cream trucks, but Secretariat and Mr. Ed are not going to get carded. <laughs> Right, and so why why define one of the, all the uh, difference? The only difference I can assume is that horses never file lawsuits. <laughs> See, because of ice cream, you get this painstaking list of exceptions and non exceptions. Yes, this actually covers you, and it feels like you gotta assume every single one of those re represents a well. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> every single one. The difference between code and law, and there is a difference, actually, is in what happens when something is undefined at runtime. In code, you know, it blows up or it causes silent data loss. In law, they say, all right, smart guy, and they figure it out. <laughs> they figure it out at runtime. Maybe they end up looking in precedent, which is their stack overflow. <laughs> And then they just do a dependency injection for the next run. And so it bothers me to see this seeming gap and vulnerability in the legal code, but it's not probably actually a problem. And that edge case thinking, it's this occupational hazard I don't think I ever got warned about in a CS class. I think they don't necessarily even really warn you about it at the recurse center. <gasps> um, it's it's like being a rules lawyer with board games, but it applies not just to you know laws and rules, but to all aspects of your environment and any plan anyone ever tries to make. 
Uh, I mean, I hang out with a lot of nerds, so board games come up a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's structured social interaction, right? It's very appealing. <laughs> uh, but I mean, as a nerd, I can be a very literal person. So there's a big aspect of board games that I struggle with, which is trash talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know this term, uh, at least in the United States, uh, when you're playing a game in a competitive manner with friends, there's a cultural practice of trash talk, which is playful insults offered among players that are meant to express comfort and camaraderie and creativity while firing up the competitive spirit, you know? And, and so like in a physical sport, you might say, hey, what you slow, you know, why you're so slow? What you waiting for? Your shoes made out of concrete. Okay, actually, I'm not good at making these up, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I care about telling the truth and being compassionate. I don't usually insult people. So when I try to imagine and come up with trash talk, uh, I have some failure modes, one of which is I just end up acting like a manager giving genuine feedback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're slow because you keep looking for the perfect move instead of a good enough one. And uh, other than that, you're doing great. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think you're hitting your quarterly goals really well. <laughs> uh, and we could, we could actually talk about a bonus at your next one on one. <laughs> <laughs> or I just veer, like, I'm trying to be like, all right, come on, I gotta, I gotta get into it. So I accidentally err on the side of being genuinely cruel. Like, hey, it's really unlikely you'd win this anyway because you're bad at adapting to new circumstances. <laughs> and that seems like a deep seated issue going back decades. That's unlikely to change. <laughs> I, that, no, no, I'm not going to do that to anybody. Oh, so, okay. Well, maybe I, I try and go for, for like a reference, you know, but I get way too in the weeds on details. Huh? When are you going to make your next move? Huh? What you waiting for? Are you waiting for Vikram Seth to publish A Suitable Girl, his long awaited sequel to his award winning epic, A Suitable Boy? <laughs> You're, you're not, you've never heard of that. Uh, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for that because he, he first announced it in 2009. And then in 2016, he even had to give back in advance to the publisher because he didn't deliver the manuscript. Uh, and I mean, I understand why it's taken him so long. He had a breakup, he, he and his boyfriend. That's very difficult. And he's been you know, involved in some activism around queer. Okay, so I realize I could have made this a more accessible reference in that last joke. Maybe people in this audience would have had an easier time if I said, well, are you waiting for George R.R. R. Martin to finish A Song of Ice and Fire? Uh, but I've actually never read those books. I have to keep it real. Um, that's the fifth social rule, actually, keep it real. Um, I think pretending you've read a book that you haven't, it might be against the code of conduct. I had to check. Um, are computers maybe better at trash talk? I'd be curious, for those of you who play a lot of video games, when you're playing against a computer, how good is it at taunting you, right? Was that something they tested with AlphaGo, you know, in all those like <laughs> Go and chess matches? You are so bad at this that you should stop trying. <laughs> Exception, you suck. <laughs> Error, object, player, has no attribute, skill. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that is that what they're doing? I, mean, like, I do think AI could be better than we are at like finding loopholes and rules lawyering because what is an error message but the ultimate well actually? <laughs> but the advantage that we as humans bring when we're trying to or accidentally being very pedantic about uh, and bringing to a screeching halt an idea that someone else has is how imaginative we can be in blocking reasonable ideas with improbable counterfactuals, right? Hey, uh, so we're just trying to, you know, make our first plan for what our, you know, what our roadmap would be. Uh, what's the core idea of this thing that we might make together that runs on reasonably widely used browsers and operating systems here in consensus reality but what if we need to be backwards compatible with an operating system that was last released on a nirvana promotional cd <laughs> <laughs> we we have this habit this thing that that creeps into us from all the debugging and all of the future proofing and it turns us into people who when other people are just trying to grow delicate new ideas we end up pouring bleach into the Cambrian tide pool. 
<laughs> Sorry, that wasn't funny. That was just real. Um, I had to keep it real. Fifth social rule. <laughs> um, my spouse has to watch out for this. He says whenever he works on parsers, he gets grouchy and nitpicky just in general. So he tries to save that word for when I'm not around. <laughs> He's like, all right, I'm just going to go into the fortress of parser solitude now <laughs> and just be grouchy while I work on nitpicky things. You go, you know, frolic with animals. Um, so, oh, uh, by the way, so my spouse, uh, one reason why he has to deal with parser things sometimes is that he is Leonard Richardson and he created the Python screen scraping library, Beautiful Soup. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Beautiful Soup is, is really useful. It's a tool that makes it easy to grab data programmatically from a website, regardless of whether the owners of that website are super into you doing that. <laughs> it's very punk rock, right? <laughs> uh, and a lot of times, I'm just going to, let's see. Hey, hey well, uh, I don't want to take a second to look at Discord, but in Discord are people like, Beautiful Soup! Uh, -huh. uh we're, we're on a delay so oh there they go all right i think it just hit the live stream so yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah that is it's what i've come to expect basically when i mention at a tech conference that i am married to the beautiful soup creator and maintainer people have a kind of bewildered adoration right uh it's like i'm mrs santa claus <laughs> they they say your your spouse made beautiful soup that was that the first project, the first programming project I ever made used beautiful. I was six years old and I needed a bus <laughs> schedule. Or, or, I, or I built my career on beautiful. My company wouldn't exist without beautiful soup. Our government, my government won a war with beautiful soup. Will you, will you tell him? Will you thank him for me? Will you hug him for me? I mean, I'm gonna hug him. That's a thing I regularly do. Uh, I guess I'll just add that metadata to our next hug. <laughs> like co-authored by. <laughs> by the way, uh, Leonard is also a leading expert on web API design application programming interfaces. He wrote the book on RESTful Web APIs. It's called restful web APIs. Um, and that is a particular philosophy of how to create APIs. If you're a website owner and you're interested in giving people programmatic access so they don't have to scrape your website to get that data, then you know you can read his book and that'll help you do that. So you can provide that properly. But if you don't, well, beautiful soup is out there. It's like if the CEO of Goodwill was also secretly Robin Hood. <laughs> Um, he also, because of, you know, being a domain expert on API design, at one point he was giving a talk about, about this topic in general. And along the way, he realized it would be useful to say, well, you know, whether or not an API is restful, is in accordance with the REST programming philosophy, that's, you know, it's not yes or no, it's kind of a spectrum. And so he laid out Oh, well, it has this attribute or that attribute. It might be more or less restful. And then several months later, someone wrote an article pointing to that like offhand sidebar part of his talk and called it the Richardson maturity model <laughs> <laughs> with capital letters. <laughs> And you fast forward several years, and now if you look on a slide share and similar slide deck sharing parts of the web, you can find marketing slide decks that advertise that a particular API is RMM level three compliant. <laughs> and this is all very embarrassing for Leonard, by the way. Imagine you're just like a biochemist and you're just like trying to keep bananas ripe longer or something. And along the way, you're like, you know, it would be nice if we could tell an acid from a base. And then people start calling it the litmus test. <laughs> They're like, Dr. Litmus, will you autograph my test strips? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, in rehearsal, I found out I had nerd sniped someone in the audience who got distracted from like the next minute of material because they went on Wikipedia to check whether litmus tests are named after a real person. They're not. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> litmus comes from an old Norse word for pulp. Uh, so please close that. You can close that tab. Um, <laughs> and in order to be responsible, I'm deprecating this joke. Uh, <laughs> please do not rely on this joke being present in future versions of this act. <laughs> it comes with a warning in this version, and then it will be removed for the next release. Uh, it is really humbling to actually look up ancient scientists and engineers, you know, these days. Uh, a few years ago, I ran across the word catenary, and I asked Leonard, what's a catenary? Uh, and he, you know, came into the bedroom and emerged, he held a cord, you know, he held one end of a cell phone charger cord high in each hand, and he said, this is a catenary, the shape a hanging cord or cable describes when its ends are held up, but gravity pulls down the weight of the cord itself. And I said, oh, so it's a parabola. And he said, actually, no. I looked it up. Galileo claimed that a catenary would be a parabola. But this was disproved by Jungius in a work published in 1669. And I said, I am so wrong. I was proved wrong in 1669. <laughs> but my spouse is so supportive. And he pointed out, well, on the other hand, you're as good as Galileo. <laughs> <laughs> This is what it's like to be constantly trying to learn is that you fail, but you can comfort yourself with the company you're in as long as you are very good at moving the goalposts. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard did okay this material, even though he's a, a pretty private person, although what it means to be a private person has definitely changed. You know, security conscious people care about privacy, but different people who care about cybersecurity draw the line in wildly different places. Right? You know, this person over here will publish their phone number so you can contact them on Signal, but they'll never publish a photo of where they are until 24 hours later. Um, if you were ever on LiveJournal, maybe you remember someone who like live blogged their sex life, but you never got to know their legal name. Mm. Right? Mm. Um, people uh, decide, all right, this bit of my life is probably going to enter the public anyway at some point so you know what i'll just be pre-doxed for your convenience <laughs> it's the it's the you can't fire me i quit of digital privacy <laughs> my, my family when i was growing up they would say what will people think what will the neighbors think well these are people who've decided why should that be a rhetorical question let's just uh resolve the superposition of that uncertainty right now and then we'll know uh, me mentioning LiveJournal, for some of you, uh, this is a blogging service that was most popular in the 2000s. And for some of you, I have taken you straight back to 2003 and how many icons you had. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, but speaking of, you know, 20 years ago, I was thinking about how much spam has changed because seeing the rise of AI uh, GPT and Copilot and all these things that can auto-generate text. I've been thinking about the first time I ever ran into auto-generated text I could really, really tell was auto-generated. Because in about 2003, I started getting spam with really weird subject lines, right? Uh, like, there was a, they just try just a little bit to, to pass the Turing test. Okay, what are things that humans say to each other? You left your umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> The server is down. You know, that's the subject line, but you open the mail and it has nothing to do with servers or umbrellas. It's like a child playing peekaboo, right? I never got, you know, like a Blade Runner type experience of a phony digital consciousness being created and seated just to sell me and to trick me and sell me something. You left your umbrella. Okay, where did I leave my umbrella? If I hit reply, what do I get? You left it on the train. Okay, thank you. How can I get it from you? Buy the pills. Like, you know, at least give me a few steps. <laughs> It's kind of insulting towards us, the humans, that they would never get to that level. I remember uh, the most plaintive ones, right, uh, where 
the last word of the subject line was complete nonsense of a key smash string generated afresh for each email because then the spam filters couldn't tell because it was a unique string each time. And they can say, oh, we've just seen that before. The one that did seem to indicate that it is really no fun being a spam AI was a subject line that said, I didn't say it would be easy. I only said, tool rest holes. <laughs> <laughs> Right now in November, 2022, we are at this AI inflection point, right? Where uh, things are taking off and a year from now, we'll have so much more capability uh, and, and new products and platforms and so on than we do right now. I have this product idea for Amazon, uh, which is an ebook that just generates more book. You know, you think you've gotten mm. <laughs> to the last chapter and then another one. So you only need to buy it once, right? Uh, <laughs> they could call it Kindle Truly Unlimited. <laughs> I'm I'm just waiting for all these tools to get good enough that I could deep fake myself so I can sleep. <laughs> Cuz it's you know what I do in life is mostly the typey typey and that is precisely what these AI tools are excellent at is is being like what if a human went typey typey right they're not even going to be loud so they're not going to annoy somebody with the noise of the mechanical keyboard. <laughs> Even though they're the ultimate mechanical keyboard. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're not going to annoy somebody. They're not going to be annoyed. But just like an AI can't be annoyed, an AI can't actually be sympathetic, right? It can fake it. You know, Eliza, as the, the psychiatrist bought from, what is this, 50 years ago now, right, could, could kind of fake a certain kind of sympathy, but an AI cannot in my opinion, uh, have, have sympathy, that's the ones that, that I know about. Um, and that is one thing that I feel when I notice those edge cases that I keep talking about, right, is when I notice, oh, but, but what if this happens? I actually feel a bit protective of it, right? It's like a, a lost kitten. I think that it needs <laughs> feeding and taking care of, right? Because I think this is an emotional reaction I have, and maybe you do too, to protect edge cases we notice so that things don't fall through the cracks. We feel like, well, I was once lonely and people didn't understand me and take care of my needs because I didn't fit in to their preconceptions of how things were going to go. And so that can that can come into you know how we take care of our code and each other. Uh, and I realize that's not necessarily the most uh, jokey thing to say. It's a, a little bit more earnest. Uh, but I, I think that's at least, you know, somewhat in keeping with what Bang Bang Con is supposed to be about, about the emotional experience, the visceral experience of programming. And I never said that all of this set would be funny. I only said, tool shots. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Bang Bang Con. <laughs>